uh, for sure in the uh, uh, in the UAE, if I am not wrong. So we welcome her today. So she will be giving us uh, uh, a story about uh, how did everything uh, start, uh, the story of the cosmos or the story universe. So please, Asma, go ahead. Hi. So today's lecture is going to be very, very, very big picture stuff. So we're going to start talking about basically the large scale structure of the universe. And then we're going to tackle how it all started, the evolution of structure in the universe, and then what is the possible fate of the universe? So just checking, is the audio good? Yes, it is excellent. Okay, perfect. So let's get started. Um, I don't know what, okay. So we're going to start with a picture. A picture is worth a thousand words, as they say. Um, so this is called the Hubble Extreme Deep Field. So this picture basically contains 5,500 galaxies. Every dot that you see in this picture is an entire galaxy. And it is an exposure time of more than 23 days from the Hubble Space Telescope that's orbiting the Earth and more than 2,000 stacked images. Because if you really want to look at the distant universe, you're going to have to really wait for all that light to reach your view. And so just to get an idea of the scale of this picture, if you see um, up here, uh, it's basically comparing the size of the extreme deep field to the moon, to a familiar object in the sky. And this is only one thirty millionth of the whole sky. So imagine 5,500 galaxies, each galaxy containing billions of stars. And that times 30 million, how vast, just how vast our universe is. And so that makes us ask a question, how did it all begin? And to answer this question, we very obviously need to look at the universe. A very important tool that helped us truly get the first view of just how vast our cosmos are and how they are truly dynamic is a type of stars called Cepheid variables. Cepheid variables are, from the name, they are variable stars, so their brightness changes with time in a periodic fashion. Now, what makes these stars very special is that there is a special relationship between their period of pulsation and their intrinsic brightness. Now, what is the difference between intrinsic brightness and the brightness that we see? For example, if we have a star and we see a very bright star in the sky, this could mean one of two things. It could mean the star itself is very bright but far away, or that the star is not very bright but very, very, very close. And so, establishing a relationship between the absolute magnitude or the intrinsic brightness of an object and its apparent brightness is going to give us the distance of that object, very simply put. So we have, so basically we see the Cepheid variable and we see the pulsation period, once we know the period, using that well-established relationship, we're going to know the intrinsic brightness. Once we know the intrinsic brightness, we're going to compare it with the observed brightness from Earth and get the distance. Now, this is exactly what Edwin Hubble did. F before, um, before 1924, Basically, all astronomers thought that the universe was only our Milky Way and that the galaxies that we see in the night sky, for example, like the Andromeda galaxy in this picture, they called them spiral nebulae. So they thought that they were just another nebula and not an entire galaxy of its own. But then when Hubble used 
his results of distance measurements using spiral using uh, Cepheid variables. He proved that these spiral nebulas are too far for them to be within our galaxy. So they must be galaxies of their own. And so that was the first major transformative um, view of the cosmos that Edwin Hubble has provided. And now an expanding universe. Now we established that there are other galaxies, but now how do we know how the universe is actually evolving? We see the movement. So the very first the very first time that the idea of an expanding universe came to be was through theory. And so there was Einstein's general theory of relativity that basically described space and time to be a four dimensional fabric that is intertwined. And it basically explained gravity as being, as being um, bending of that fabric thus causing the motion of objects when they are in the gravitational field of an object. And then in 1922, Alexander Friedman applied this theory to the fabric of the universe. And through the calculations, he postulated that the universe could be expanding. It could be a dynamic universe. And so Hubble exactly proved that. How? Well, light is a wave. And if light is a wave, then the Doppler effect applies to it. What is the Doppler effect? The Doppler effect is basically telling you that the wavelength changes based on the movement of the source relative to the observer. So here we have a star, or let's say a galaxy, since we're talking about galaxies here. And we see the observed wavelength when the object is stationary. But then the wavelength increases when that source is moving away from the observer. And this is called a red shift. Because with light, the longer the wavelength, the more red it becomes. So redshift means the wavelength is increasing, getting closer to the red part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And so how do we actually observe that redshift? How do we observe that wavelength increase due to an object moving away from us? We observe it through spectral lines. And so what are spectral lines when an electron in an atom moves between energy levels. If it moves down an energy level, it's going to emit a photon of light with an exact energy, exact wavelength that is corresponding to that unique energy configuration of that chemical element. And so each spectral line has a well-known wavelength. So we know exactly what it is at a stationary um, source. And so if we observe a star or a galaxy, and we see that there is a shift that this spectral line that we know where it should be is somewhere not quite where it should be, then we know there is movement of that object relative to us. And so that is important because the redshift here is going to Basically, the shift in the wavelength is going to give us the velocity of that object relative to us. And this is what Edwin Hubble did. There were already some previous measurements by Vesto Slifer and Milton um, that they showed that there is a redshift coming from distant galaxies or spiral nebulae. But they didn't really make that connection with the expansion of the universe. What Edwin Hubble did was he combined his distance measurements with the redshift measurements. And what he noticed was that the farther away the galaxy is, the greater 
the redshift is. So as you can see here, the lines are shifting more and more the farther away the galaxy is, which means by this equation, it means that the velocity is greater. So what? So this is what he published, uh, his initial um, graph or Hubble diagram, as it is called. Uh, so there is a almost linear relationship. Of course, there was a lot of error there. And you can see there is a mislabeled um, y-axis here. It should be kilometers per hour, I believe. Um, and yeah, as we can see, um, there is an almost linear relationship between the distance and the velocity. Now let's visualize this just to see exactly what that means for an expanding universe. So imagine that we are in the Andromeda galaxy. We took a journey to the Andromeda galaxy here. And according to Einstein's theory of relativity, the entire universe is a grid. And so that, that, imagine this to be the initial distance of these two galaxies. One is more distant than the other. And then the entire grid of space expanded within a certain amount of time. Now, what do you notice? The distance that is traveled by the closer galaxy is, uh, sorry, uh, do you see the mouse moving when I move the mouse? Can anyone no, add? No, we don't see the mouse moving, no. Oh, no. Okay. Um, but is it still um, is it still understandable? Okay, now, okay. Yes, now I can see the mouse. So go slowly. Oh, yes, slowly. I see, yeah. I, okay. see, I, I see the arrow. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, so we can see that with the, so the entirety of space has expanded by a certain amount within a certain amount of time. Right. So what we see here with the blue line here is that the galaxy that is further away has moved a greater distance than the galaxy that is closer within the same amount of time. So distance, a greater distance over the same amount of time is a greater speed. So Hubble's basically what Hubble found was that the entire grid of space is expanding and this is called metric expansion <clears throat> so it's called metric expansion and it's not that the galaxies themselves are moving away from us in space but rather galaxies are moving away from us as a result of the expansion of space and so this is how we visualize expansion of the universe now let's travel back in time right now the universe is expanding so in the past, it must have been smaller, right? So go back in time, go back in time and go back in time. At some point, the entire universe was just a tiny little point, a singularity. And that was the Big Bang Theory. Let's look at its timeline really quickly. In the beginning, there was an infinitely small, infinitely dense fireball. All the four forces of nature are unified. There was no matter, there was no light, there was no space or time outside of that infinitely small, infinitely dense fireball that no physics can currently explain. And then that expanded. For some reason, it went bang. And then what happened? Slowly, well, actually rapidly in comparison to um, our you know, sense of time, um, this, there were three forces in nature. The first force to separate was gravity. And then the strong nuclear force and the electroweak force started separating afterwards. And after that, there was a very rapid expansion of the universe caused, called cosmic inflation. And this expansion was of an order of 10 to this, um, 10 to the 60, I, I believe, is it? Uh, 10 to the 30, sorry. Um, so it was very, very rapid expansion. And then the photons emerge because the, electri the electromagnetic force has separated from the weak nuclear force. But 
the universe was still too hot to even form protons and neutrons. So there was no matter, no, I mean, there were fermions, but there was no protons and neutrons that we know of. And then at 10 to negative five to one second, the universe cooled down enough for the quarks to form protons and neutrons. And at 10 seconds, the protons and neutrons bound into the nuclei of atoms. So at that point, the universe was basically a very hot soup of atomic nuclei and free electrons and light. But the universe at that point was still opaque. Basically, what happened was that the density of electrons, as you see in this picture, the density of electrons in the universe was way too high that it continuously scattered photons of light. So whenever light wanted to escape, wanted to find a way out, it would collide, it would scatter off of an electron. And then it would try to find its way out again, and it would scatter off of another, another electron. And that is exactly the same thing that makes our sun opaque, why it's, our sun is not transparent. So basically, our universe was kind of like our sun, well, the inside of our sun. And so at a very special time, 37, uh, 370,000 years, when our universe was 370,000 years old, now, what happened was recombination. Recombination. That means that the atomic nuclei have bound to the electrons because at that point, the universe was cool enough that the energy was below the ionization energy for the atoms, mainly hydrogen and helium. And the electrons started to bind through the electromagnetic force to the new atomic nuclei. And so naturally, the electron density would go down, and then the light will find its way out. And that is the first time that the universe became transparent to light. And this escaped radiation, we can still see it to this day. It was first observed with a radio telescope in 1964, and they won a Nobel Prize for it. And basically, what we see today is this. This is called the cosmic microwave background radiation. And actually, you can see it in our planetarium when you visit and you have a, an entire beautiful trip to the very edge of the universe, you're going to be able to see this all around you in the dome. It's pretty beautiful. Please come and see it. <laughs> um, anyway, so this is the cosmic microwave background radiation. Um, from the name, it's in the microwave part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And this is the radiation that is coming from the recombination of the electrons with the atomic nuclei. And so if I go back, let's go back. Um, if I go back to this picture here, you can see that as an electron moves to a lower energy level, it emits light. And this is exactly the light that we see from the recombination. However, it has been redshifted to the microwave part of the spectrum because the universe was at 3000 degrees, 3000 degrees Kelvin back then. But now the universe is at 2.72 Kelvins. And that radiation has been redshifted to a longer wavelength. And that's why we see it in the microwave part of the spectrum. And this is actually one of the most important pieces of evidence for the Big Bang Theory, because if you see here, it looks the same pretty much everywhere. One of the most important postulates of the Big Bang Theory is that the universe is homogeneous, which means that each, part, each patch of the universe each random sample of the universe will look the same, homogeneous and isotropic, meaning that it will look the same in every direction. And the cosmic microwave background pretty much shows that. There are, however, some 
anisotropies and inhomogeneities in the structure that are currently being studied and the source of which is being studied because as you will see later, this will be the very basic building blocks of the big structures in the universe, like galaxies and galaxy clusters. And so moving forward, so there was light escaping, um, going back to the Big Bang timeline. Uh, light escaped for the first time. Now we have atoms um, that we have hydrogen and helium atoms mostly. And then the universe will start to get more familiar and more beautiful. And now we're going to see a bunch of beautiful visuals that I hope you will greatly enjoy as I do. So at 100 million years old, the first stars were born, born in beautiful nebulae, like this one. This is the Eagle Nebula. And you can see the pinkish, uh, reddish, light that is coming here. This is the hydrogen alpha line. Um, it's coming from the recombination of um, hydrogen with electrons when it gets ionized and then recombining with the electrons due to the very hot nearby stars that are being formed in these structures. So how do stars form? Um, they basically form through gravitational collapse. So as you can see here, there are little knots. And so there are two competing forces. There, there's the inwardly pull, uh, the inwardly pulling gravitational force. And then there is the heat, the radiation pressure that is trying to push the gas outwards. And so as the as gravity wins and the collapse continues, a star is formed when it is in a state of hydrostatic equilibrium, meaning that the radiation, the radiation pressure and the gravitational force are balanced. And when that balance happens, there is nuclear fusion, there is hydrogen and helium. Uh, well, first there's hydrogen burning in the core, there's nuclear fusion that is continuously forming heavier elements. And so that was the beginning of the formation of the heavier elements in the universe. The very early populations of stars were mostly hydrogen and helium because there was pretty much no other heavier elements that were formed from Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And so you're going to have these very big and bright stars that can be around 100 times as massive as the sun that burn bright and burn fast and form the heavier elements. And then the interstellar feedback cycle will happen where the star is going to explode in a supernova world. The very massive star will explode in a supernova explosion that is going to expel all of those heavier elements that were formed and form heavier elements in the way and mix them up with the interstellar medium. And yeah, this is the material that is going to end up creating planets, um, solar systems. And yeah, just a beautiful process of uh, this is a, a beautiful process of birthing the star in the interstellar medium. And then the star burning and forming all of these elements and then returning back heavier elements into the um, returning back the heavier elements into the interstellar medium. And these are examples of planetary nebulae. Those were uh, uh, supernova remnants, which happen when a very massive star died, which would be what happened to the very, very early stars. And then we have the very uh, then we have uh, for the planetary nebulae, which form in a much less dramatic way um, by less massive stars and forming a leaving a white dwarf right in the middle here. This is the cat's eye nebula, absolutely gorgeous. This is butterfly nebula and just so much beauty in our universe. And 
being in a, in the planetarium, I think it's important, an important part of my job to remind people of the beauty of our universe. And so that's what we're doing here. We're going to talk about the story of the universe. Might as well talk about how beautiful it is, right? And actually enjoy the visuals. So now we formed our stars. We got our heavier elements. We got our interstellar feedback cycle. Now let's talk about the first galaxies. So the first galaxies would form as in, in the beginning, they will, they're just going to be a bunch of stars that are coming together through gravity. Of course, there are it's much more complicated than that, because there would be um, complicated stuff like density waves that are related to the cosmic inflation that happened way before, and that is studied through um, the anisotropies in the cosmic microwave background. But to make it simple, Let's just think of it as stars coming together. And so they start looking very irregular in the beginning, um, like this, like clusters of stars. And then uh, moving forward, bigger and bigger collections of stars start forming. Um, and we still see, of course, obviously, because we have the pictures here, we still see galaxies looking like this um, in the universe. Um, they're called irregular galaxies. And we actually have two of them orbiting our Milky Way, the large and small Magellanic clouds. And so uh, this is the Hubble diagram for the uh, shape and evolution of uh, galaxies. And so we start here with the irregulars. And then moving forward, the shape becomes more spiral as it keeps accumulating more mass and um, it keeps rotating. It starts looking more and more uniform in the, uh, the spiral sense. And then moving forward, it will start gaining more of an elliptical shape as it gets older. And so, we were at the irregulars and then slowly they're going to start to morph their shape and start to look more like a spiral and we have here the grand design spirals looking absolutely perfect and absolutely beautiful and as you can see here the spiral arms of these galaxies with the red light here contain so many star forming regions uh, so there's continuous star formation going on. And now there's an interesting uh, little part here, and that is actually a gal galaxy collision. And so it's not only that galaxies morph their shape with time, but they also bind together when they come in close proximity enough for them for that to happen. And so here is a wonderful simulation of what that would look like. Um, here we go. Um, so it's a simulation of the process of galactic mergers. Now this entire process takes one around 1.5 billion years. As you can see here, the two galaxies are coming close enough together. And then a cosmic dance happens. And now you see that you, you might worry that uh, what if the stars collide together? They, they don't. Because while they look like they're close together, they are in fact quite far from each other that they will not collide. And currently, our galaxy is on a collision course with the Andromeda galaxy, but that won't happen for billions of years. And so here is the beautiful process that happens. It takes about 1.5 billion years. So when we observe that, what we're actually seeing, whoops, okay. What we're actually seeing is, so this is a very, very beautiful example of a galaxy merger. Because it takes such a long time scale, what we're actually seeing is just a snapshot of that process. And if you see all of that red light here, all of these are star forming regions. 
And that's why these galaxies can be called starburst galaxies, because the collision process compresses so much gas that it can trigger so much star formation. And so these are just snapshots of this beautiful cosmic dance forming bigger and bigger galaxies as we go forward. And then the, the gas and dust that we see in the, in the galaxies will not last forever, right? Because they're going to keep con continu continuously use that to form new stars. Yes, it's going to be interstellar feedback cycle, but there's not going to be a lot of interstellar medium left. And so the galaxies will start to morph their shape into lenticular galaxies, into elliptical galaxies, which are mostly old stars, and extremely massive combinations of older stell stellar populations. And then all of these galaxies evolving together, colliding, come together, forming Star, uh, forming galaxy clusters. And these are just so beautiful to look at. And galaxy clusters and galaxy super clusters. And so this is the largest scale of the universe that we have um, observed so far. Galaxy super clusters. Every dot here is a galaxy. And uh, this is an entire survey that is dedicated to mapping out the large scale structure of the universe, which you can also see when you visit us in the planetarium. Um, so yeah, our universe is absolutely magnificently beautiful and massive. Now, where are we going? Let's see here. Now, we looked at a type of stars to understand how the universe started out and it was the Cepheid variables in order for us to determine the distance of the galaxies. And now we're going to look at another type of distance indicator that is very important for us to understand the fate of the universe. And that is a type 1a supernova. As we can see in the picture here, this is a remnant of a type 1a supernova. How does this occur? When you have two, uh, when you have a uh, white dwarf in a binary star system where the white dwarf is accreting mass, the white dwarf is gaining mass. And when it gains enough mass that it starts a nuclear fusion reaction, a runaway nuclear fusion reaction, meaning that the temperature just keeps increasing and the nuclear uh, synthesis rate keeps increasing and increasing, it causes an explosion. Now, what makes this very special is, well, two things. One is that it's, ex it's extremely bright, 5 billion times the brightness of the sun. So we're going to see it, even if it's so, so far away. Cepheid variables can, cannot, we cannot really observe Cepheid variables at such distances. And so type 1a supernovae are very important because they allow us to look much, much deeper, much, much further into the universe. Because the further that we look into the universe, the further in the past that we look, because light has a finite speed and it takes a certain amount of time to reach us. So the farther away the object, the older it is. And so it will allow us Type 1a supernovae allow us to look at the more distant, more ancient universe. But they're also important because they are standard candles. Like the Cepheid variables, we know what their intrinsic brightness is from studying them theoretically. They're always at about a fixed intrinsic brightness. So when we observe their brightness from Earth, compare that with their intrinsic brightness that we know very well from theory, we can determine the distance. So these type 1a supernovae have been used to observe the very distant universe. And scientists found a very, very, very interesting conclusion. And that is the distance measurements showed that 
the very far away galaxies are much further than expected by the model of a expanding universe with the same rate of expansion at all redshifts. So if we is so basically a model that assumes that the universe was expanding at the same rate at all times is going to fail to predict the exact distances of such distance distant galaxies that we actually observe. Now, what that means is that the universe in the past was expanding at a slower rate. So it means that if it was expanding more slowly, it means that as it grows to get to its current size, it took longer for it to reach that specific size than we thought. And so the light that we observe from the supernova at such a high redshift traveled a longer time because the universe took a longer time to get there. If that light took a longer time to reach us, then that means it traveled a greater distance. And so it is at a greater, greater distance than estimated due to the accelerating expansion of the universe. And as we can see here from the plot, for nearby galaxies, because in nearby galaxies, we don't really, we're not really looking that far back into the past of the universe. So the rate of expansion was not very different from what it is now. But when we look further, then the rate of expansion was much slower. And that is where there is deviation from the linear Hubble diagram that we saw before. And now, what is the reason for this accelerating expansion? We don't know, and hence the term dark energy. But hopefully in the future, I am sure that we will. And now, the ultimate fate of the universe. There are different scenarios that are going to depend on two factors, because we have the force of gravity pulling everything together from the dark um, uh, from the matter that we see in the universe and dark matter. Um, and there is another force, which is this dark energy, this mysterious dark energy that is trying to pull everything apart. And so the balance between the, these two forces is going to ultimately determine what is going to happen to the universe. And we have a very important parameter here called the density parameter. And it is the ratio of the observed density of the universe and the critical density. The critical density is that at which the universe just continuously keeps expanding, but slows down slowly, 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 slows down. And so depending on the density of the universe and the density of matter versus dark energy, we're going to know where the universe is going. This is who, where we are right now. If the, you know, the density of the universe is much greater than the critical density, so because this is a ratio, the, it will be one if the universe's density is equal to the critical density. So if it's greater than that, it's just going to go to a big crunch. The relative size of the universe is going to decrease and go back into another singularity. But we know that this is not the case because this is not what observations are showing us. And then we have the critical density universe with no dark energy. It will just continuously, continuously expand, but slow down uh, very, very gradually. And then we have a uh, universe with less than the critical density, but no dark energy, it will slow down, but not as fast as it will slow down, but not as much as a critical density universe. And then we have the case for an accelerating expansion, where we have both matter and um, dark energy causing the universe to get bigger at an accelerating rate. And observations, as we saw, support this accelerating expansion scenario, um, which is also called a big freeze, because what's going to happen eventually is 
as the universe just continuously expands and expands, the, the stars are going to die off. The interstellar material is going to run out. The universe is going to become dark. It's going to become cold. It's going to be just a bunch of black holes hanging out. And then over extremely long time scales, even the protons themselves are going to decay and just decay in darkness, which sounds pretty scary, but we don't know what will happen in the future. We, we're trying to understand that, and hopefully it will not be as scary as that. <laughs> um, so we went from the very beginning to the very, very end as we understand it. One thing that we learn from the universe, the only constant is change. And change is a necessity for evolution and growth. Without change, none of this would have been here. So let's be grateful for what we have and look for the best. And thank you. Thank you very much, Asma, for this nice lecture and for thank the you. nice picture, nice view. Uh, Amy, uh, let me open the floor. If you have any questions, please, from the audience. Can you please, Asma, go back one slide? Yeah. Yeah, this this is the as as we all know, this is the most important uh, slide regarding cosmology and uh, uh, all the other theories. Maybe, maybe maybe you discussed here only one theory. It's just the Big Bang, yes. Yeah. So, what about other theories for the universe? Um, there there is one with the cyclic universe. Yeah which goes uh, through a big crunch and then another big bang, which is interesting. And uh, there's also the big rip, which is mostly dark energy that's completely ripping the universe apart. What about uh, parallel cosmos? Parallel cosmos is quite interesting. Um, I think that goes into string theory, if I'm correct. Yes. Um, and honestly, to me, if we can't prove it, and if we can't disprove it, then it's a possibility. So, <laughs> and of course, everything is a possibility, even the Big Bang, yeah. from my point of view. Yeah. None of us knows uh, what's actually the, the, the case. Is it true that the universe is expanding forever, or is it going to, to have the big crunch? As, as we all know in, in the Holy Quran, I am. Actually, um, I ha we have to be uh, careful when we talk about the relation between the Quran and the science. But you may be asked, uh, in the Holy Quran, we have كَمَا بَدَنَا وَلَا خَلْقٍ نُعِيدُهُ وَعْدًا عَلَيْنَا يَوْمَ نَطْوِ السَّمَاءَ كَطِيِّ السِّجِلِّ لِلْكُتُبِ كَمَا بَدَنَا وَلَا خَلْقٍ نُعِيدُهُ وَعْدًا عَلَيْنَا إِنَّا كُنَّا فَاعِلِينَ Had this, this uh, verse just um, says, that the, the, the whole universe is uh, going to the big crunch, which is uh, actually against the observations. Uh, the observ observations uh, support the, the accelerating and the expansion, uh, as we all uh, saw in, in, the, in the lecture and we all uh, usually see in, in the publications these days. But even the, uh, the observations uh, these days still need more precise uh, observations. That's why astronomers are um, sending more missions to the space, uh, more uh, high resolution uh, uh, imagers, and they are trying to use different uh, techniques of observing the, the whole parts in the universe and trying to detect in, in a way or another uh, or to define what is dark energy. From my point of view, the key is the dark energy. If we know what is dark energy, we may get completely different picture for the universe. We don't know yet. Uh, yeah, that's uh, true. We are not sure that this is the, the right case. This is the, 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 the true situation of the universe. Who knows? Uh, Allahu alam. Yeah. Uh, so 
I, I, I duly, we have to be careful when we support any of these theories. Um, just, we are saying it's a theory. Um, after 10 years, we may get completely different image. Yeah, because Maybe after Professor all, Elias, we... uh, has another idea. Uh, he's uh, closer to the galaxies. He's, his field is the galaxies. And uh, so the galaxies uh, are the key for understanding uh, the universe. But, Thank you. Uh, our, 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 what we understand from the universe is based upon our observation. And through observation, there to be some theories to expand this observation. That's what we need always to, as Galileo said, whenever you do science, you should put your faith aside. That's very, very important. Uh, I have a comment, uh, Asma, about uh, the uh, Hubble fog diagram that you showed. And you said it is, uh, it is some kind of, of evolution, uh, as far as I know. So the Hubble fog diagram is... Uh, is a classification which is only through morphology. Uh, a spiral galaxy will not become an elliptical one unless, unless, unless you have a collusion. That's very, very important. Mm -hmm. So if you take, if we, if we take two spirals, so they may collide and they may incite more and more to be maybe, maybe some kind of uh, uh, small or elliptical galaxy. But uh, the uh, the Hubble diagram is uh, is a morphological classification. Mm -hmm. It doesn't do with evolution. And this is exactly what Hubble said. Hubble, uh, he thought that it was, uh, or some people said Hubble thought that it was an evolution, but it was just a classification. It's not like, it's mm -hmm. not like uh, the uh, the HR diagram in which, mm -hmm. yes, it is an evolution diagram. But what about moving from an irregular galaxy to a spiral? Would that be an evolution? Well, it is it is it is part uh, it is part of uh, of a galaxy uh, environment. What to, what is the intergalactic medium around it that does play mm -hmm. a very very important role here? But uh, a spiral is a spiral, mm -hmm. so it doesn't become an elliptical after a couple of uh, hundreds, maybe billions of years. Any other question, please? Okay, no questions. So we thank Asma again for the nice lecture, the nice, also the nice voice. Asma, <laughs> the nice voice. <laughs> so for sure, people will enjoy your talk at the planetarium. So we thank you thank for you. that. And uh, I hope that my student uh, did follow very well because uh, we are talking about stars and, uh, and everything. So this week, so, so this is a very good review for them. Thank you again for the audience and see you next week. There's another uh, lecture next week to be by myself. For sure. <laughs> so I'm going to advertise for myself. Uh, I will talk about radio astronomy and hopefully you will appreciate it. So thank you again. we we'll see you next week, inshallah. as alaikum. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank just you, Asma. Allow me just in seconds to mention the competition. Yes, please. Go ahead. Thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you also, Asma. It was a great uh, lecture. Um, I would like to, to announce again, it is weekly competition we organize in the planetarium. So uh, everyone, the audience can uh, participate. We announce this uh, through the emails, uh, the uh, staff and students as well. So please uh, try to uh, participate and uh, if you solve the mystery which is uh, will be really beautiful for the next time as well uh, for the last week I mean starting from Monday to Thursday so if you win you will be given a binocular to observe the galaxies <laughs> and I'm afraid not all galaxies <laughs> that Asma mentioned maybe you will see our galaxy and also maybe the, the uh, Andromeda galaxy thank you very much Thank you, thank you, thank you, Marwan. So, see you next week, everyone. So, Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum, assalam.